Amen. Well, uh, we're going to do some more questions. We're nearly to the end of this series on important questions. We've got some questions that came from an event out of Dallas, Texas. And then we've got some questions that uh, come from Facebook and some questions that come from people in our congregation as they get to know us better. And so I've got five or six questions that I've earmarked for today that I think will be helpful. Um, You know, as we start a fall semester, some people will be kicking our tires. They'll be seeing uh, what we're about. They'll be wondering what we teach and what we don't teach and what we believe and why we believe it. And so um, I think this, uh, this morning will be really helpful in that regard. So this first question, it says, I, I know that you're not teaching a license to sin and you're not advocating things like murder, etc. So doesn't God cause us to actually fulfill the law? So that's a really good question. I mean, um, is there anything about the message of the gospel that is um, anti-murder? Is there anything about the, the, the gospel that is anti-adultery? Uh, the answer is absolutely, because Jesus will never motis- motivate us to do these things. But the question is, how, how do you get around uh, to avoiding sin without the law? And now that's an ironic question because actually the Bible teaches that apart from law, sin is dead. And that's not very intuitive to us. We think that with law, we can make sin dead. But the Bible says apart from law, sin is dead. So we believe that we are actually teaching the the very best way to avoid sinfulness. We're teaching the one and only authentic, genuine way to uh, say no to sin and say yes to God. I'm reminded of Romans 7. It says that we have to die to the law so that we might serve God and bear fruit. So we serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. So what we're about is serving God. We're really all about serving God. But the question is, how do we serve God? We do not serve God through the law. We serve God through having faith in his son and allowing his son to bear fruit in our lives. And this is a fragrant aroma to God, a pleasing sacrifice. The only sacrifice that we come with is not a legalistic obedience sacrifice. It is a sacrifice of the fruit of lips that give thanks to our God. And so what this message actually does in human hearts is it generates a a, a heartfelt thankfulness. And from that place of thankfulness, um, Jesus Christ just begins to ooze out of us through our unique personalities. We believe that, that, that because we've been given the life of Jesus Christ, that through his resurrection, he infuses us with himself. As I often say, he cleans house and moves in. And then he does this in order to ooze out through our unique personalities. An expression of Christ. That's what we're designed to be. So the Bible says that living under the law is like living under a curse. And we don't want that for anyone. We've experienced at least a taste of that. Most of us in this room, we could cite a time where we... We, maybe we gave it our best shot, and we said, God, I'm, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know what's happened in the past, but God, I'm really going to do it this time. And we've, we've given it our best effort, and then we've seen the fruit of law living, and we don't want anyone to be under the curse of the law. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 tells us that even the Ten Commandments that are written on stone are a ministry of condemnation and death. Now, does that mean that we are um, against the Ten Commandments, anti-Ten Commandments? No, they're a tool and they serve a purpose, but they just don't keep anybody from sin. They don't keep anyone from sin. So what is their purpose? To show people what sin is so that we turn to Christ and trust him alone to avoid sin. So let's leave the law at the door of salvation. The law shows us our sinfulness, our need for Jesus Christ, but we leave law at the door and we enter into Christ and in Christ we are dead to the law and free from the law and not under the law because Jesus is the only one in the house. So 
what about Romans 7 again? I mean, you know, Paul says he's doing the very thing that he says he doesn't want to do. Do you remember this passage? And it's interesting because a lot of Christians that I've met over the years, they almost use Romans 7 as the excuse chapter. Uh, Romans 7 can become the excuse chapter. Well, I mean, oh, the Apostle Paul, I mean, even he didn't have victory over sin. I mean, he was doing the very thing he didn't want to do. So, you know, until we get to heaven, there's probably not any real hope or victory over sin for any of us. If he couldn't pull it off, how could we pull it off? But again, this issue of law becomes important. Because remember that the live under the law. And that is precisely why he is doing the very thing he doesn't want to do. Because living under the law produces confusion, disobedience, and sinfulness. And we don't want that. We don't want that for ourselves. We don't want that for you. We don't want that for anyone. And so we believe with all of our hearts that we are leading people into a place of genuine obedience because we are leading them away from law living and into dependency on Christ within. None of this works if Christ is not within. We are trusting that Christ is within. So we do not invite the unbeliever to abandon law and just have a free-for-all in whatever. No, 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 no. The law is a tool to show the unrighteous their need for Jesus. But we do invite the believer to abandon law and have a free, for all, free fall right down into the midst of Jesus Christ. And in him, we find our balance, we find our strength, we find our source for upright living. Well, what about when they came to Jesus and they said, you know... What about the greatest laws? I mean, Jesus seemed to advocate the greatest laws, like love your neighbor as yourself and stuff, right? So that was part of the law. Shouldn't we obey that part of the law? Wake up every day and try to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, it's interesting because there's a subtle truth in that, that the New Testament is filled with passages about love, and we do believe it's, it's important to love other people. But remember the conversation the Jewish people, they were so-called experts, and they came to Jesus maybe sort of to trap him, perhaps, and they said, show us, the, show us the, what's the greatest thing ever written in the law. And Jesus says, you want to know the greatest? These are the greatest. And one of them he names is, is love your neighbor as yourself. Now, but remember that Jesus has identified these as being in the law in the Jewish law. These are ingredients of the Jewish law. And then he turns around and he says, a new command I give you, love others even as I have loved you. So love your neighbor as yourself and you know, honor your God, love your God with all your heart, all, all your mind, all your strength. I mean, give it your best to love God and love others. That's still a law approach. And Jesus turns and he says, a new command I give you, Soak in my love, get to know how much I love you, and then pass that on to other people. This is why we keep talking about these wonderful things, the, the love of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the, the new identity we have in Christ. Do you see what we're doing? We want all of us to be welling up from, from inside, welling up from inside about the love of God, so that then it begins to naturally uh, flow out to other people in a normal, natural way. Do you know that walking by God's Spirit, living in God's Spirit, and walking by God's Spirit is normal? Like, that was what they were doing. That was life in the Garden of Eden. The idea of living in God's Spirit and walking by God's Spirit is not supposed to be scary or nebulous, or weird, or far off. It's supposed to be natural, and human, and normal, because this is what was lost in the garden, and it's regained through Jesus Christ. And so we believe this can happen in a normal environment, but the new normal is to know that you're dead to the law. This cannot happen under the law. The Spirit of God will not cooperate with legalistic living. 
The Spirit of God insists that he has the market cornered on morality and ethics and that he is our source of life. This is why we teach what we teach. All right, um, it says, in the Old Testament, we, re- we receive different languages at the Tower of Babel, or Babel. Then at Pentecost, we see different languages. First Corinthians talks a lot about the gift of tongues. Some say we all have a spiritual language. This doesn't appear to be scriptural. Can you comment on this? topic. What about those who say, I I find a spiritual language and everybody has a spiritual language? Great question. In fact, I think um, in the city of Lubbock, Texas, this sort of uh, movement and nationally and worldwide is becoming more and more popular that if you're in Christ and you're a Christian and you've got the Holy Spirit and you're saved and you've got a new destination, We love that. Fantastic. Congratulations. But, and here it comes, the big but. It's always there, isn't it? But you need a spiritual language, and if you don't have one, you're not experiencing God to the fullest. You're missing something. Now, let's start with the idea, first of all, that the New Testament tells us that everyone in the room who is in Christ, everyone has an anointing. You know, 1 John chapter 2, in two places, it says that you all know the truth and that you all have an anointing. So this idea that some are anointed, maybe you've seen uh, some people walking around with a little uh, name tag or business card that says, I'm an apostle with a special anointing. Well, um, you know, really it's comforting to realize that the Bible tells us that you have everything you need, you are complete You are lacking nothing. You even have this anointing. And the anointing is the Holy Spirit himself. The anointing is a person. The anointing is not some add-on. It's not some extra option where you bought the Honda Accord, but you didn't, didn't buy the navigation system. A lot of Christians are running around acting like it's great that you're, you're this wonderful, shiny new car, but you've missed out on the GPS, and I've got what you don't have. So when you actually look into this idea of a spiritual language, uh, you find some very interesting things. Um, First of all, Paul tells us there's a variety and a diversity. And he says, not all have gifts of healing, do they? He says, not all have gifts of miracles, do they? And he even goes as far to say, not all speak in tongues, do they? Not all interpret, do they? And so... What would it be like if we tried to make everybody in here a preacher? What would it be like if we tried to make everybody in here a healer? And we're going to have a school of healing, and we're going to teach everybody how to heal people miraculously. And we're just sort of hoping that God shows up to the school, too, to kind of make things run smoothly. Well, I'm afraid that the gift of tongues has turned into this. I mean, there are schools, so to speak, or classes where you learn to speak in tongues, Um, this is a very dangerous ground to tread on because you don't teach another person to have a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are given by God's Spirit. They are motivated and animated by God, and not all people have a certain gift, do they, Paul says. So next, when you look at the idea of tongues, you have to remember that whatever it is, and I'll get there in a moment, my opinion on it, but whatever it is, it should happen by two people or by three people at most or not at all if there's no interpreter. So if you walk into a building and there's a group of 16 or 28 or 537 people chattering in a foreign spiritual language, guess what? The Apostle Paul would condemn that. He would say that's not what we want to do, that's chaos. There's too many of you. Nobody can say amen because they don't understand it. And there's no interpreter for all you guys. So keep quiet. Otherwise, the unbeliever who comes in the back door is going to think you are nuts. And that's specifically what he says. He's, he says, they're going to come in and say, are these people not mad? They're wacko. 
And unfortunately, when things are done in that manner, this is precisely the reputation that Christians can get. Now, um, I'm going to give you my opinion. This is the for what it's worth department. Um, Acts chapter 2 talks about the gift of tongues, and it says, And everyone heard in their own language. They heard the gospel message preached in their own language. And so it goes on to name the languages. And the languages that are named are human languages, not angel language, not spiritual babble that cannot be understood, but, but human languages. And then Paul tells us that tongues are a sign, not for the believer, but for the unbeliever. What kind of sign would tongues be for the unbeliever? Oh my goodness, I'm hearing the gospel in my own language from this fisherman guy who does not normally speak my language. This is a sign to me. I might just accept Jesus Christ now. Do you see it? The sign to the unbeliever jives perfectly with Acts chapter 2. Now, of course, people go on to say, well, wait a minute. There are two kinds of tongues. You have misunderstood. There is a tongues type A, and then there is a tongues type B. The tongues type A is the missionary gift that you speak of, and the tongues type B is a private prayer language. Okay, well, if it's private, then why are 568 people doing it in the church service? Number one, Paul seems to condemn that, not condone it. Now, secondly, again, I'm going to give you my opinion, and I invite you to read through the book of Corinthians and gather your own thoughts about it. But my opinion is that Paul is actually saying, he talks about praying in a tongue, and then he talks about singing in a tongue. Do you hear this? This is singing, not praying. He says, praying in a tongue and singing in a tongue, and then he goes on, and his train of thought is actually, in conclusion, no, no, I'm going to use my spirit and my mind. Because if I'm speaking in Swahili and praying in Swahili and singing in Swahili, then who will say the amen? No one will understand what I'm saying. I will be like a barbarian. Therefore, I will pray with my spirit and my mind. Therefore, I will sing with my spirit and my mind. Why is he saying and his mind? Because he doesn't even know necessarily what's going through his head or what God's motivating him miraculously to say in Swahili. So the point that Paul gets to is nobody can understand you when you're praying this way. Nobody can understand you when you're singing this way, important, because very little singing in tongues seems to happen. Nobody can understand you. Nobody can understand you. Therefore, include your mind and don't do this. Don't abuse the missionary gift in a church service because no one can say amen to it. So that's my personal opinion on Paul. Uh, he actually says the opposite of what many people say. They'll read uh, Corinthians and come out saying, see, we're supposed to pray and sing in a tongue. And then Paul is really saying, wait, wait a minute. I will actually do the opposite. I'm recommending you do the opposite. Let's use our minds all the time, especially in the church setting. If spiritual growth is not dying to self, then what is it? Man, that's a great question. You've heard that spiritual growth is dying to self. That would mean that the idea of spiritual growth is you become lesser and God becomes greater. You sort of get shuffled out the way. It's kind of like in the old theater when they'd reach out with the cane and pull the guy to the side of the stage. Uh, you're done, right? God's turn. So is Christianity essentially a progressive motion of you're done, God's turn? Is that the gospel? The gospel is prettier than that. The gospel is more beautiful than that. The gospel includes you. The gospel allows you to participate with Christ. And Romans 6 calls this being united with Jesus Christ. So when we're united with Jesus Christ, we become part of the play. We're part of the production. Yes, there's a director, but we get to be an actor. And it's awesome. 
And so this idea of dying to self, the phrase actually appears zero times in the Bible. It doesn't appear. And the closest thing we have is that your old self died. So when you think about this, what we're saying is there's this, this way to live that doesn't involve you being torn apart, you being shoved in a corner. Nobody puts baby in a corner. <laughs> it doesn't involve you being diminished because God is bigger than that. God is more creative than that. So what human religion does, which is why we call ourselves, you know, church without religion, what human religion tends to do is say, God wants to love you, God wants to like you, but you're the problem, you can't fix yourself, and you'll never be fixed by anybody. So even after you're in Christ, man, you are dirt, you are slime, you are a worm, you are a dirty, rotten sinner, and you need to exit stage left and just let God do because you can't even participate. And this is the dying to self. You, and then people will say, well, yeah, I really think, you know, I've been trying to get on the altar and die to self, but I keep crawling off, right? I keep crawling off the altar. You know what that means? It means uh, I keep participating. <laughs> I keep playing a role. I keep choosing things. See, God wants our chooser in the midst of it. God wants our hearts, our chooser, our life, our personality, our sense of humor. God is not trying to get rid of you. He's not telling you to get out of his way. He, he can be in the midst of your way. Your way can be his way. The two ways come together, united with Christ. It's okay to be you. After all, I mean... My goodness, what are we telling people? We're saying you got born again. What does that look like? Who were you born as? Were you born a second time as dirty, rotten, and slimy? Were you born a second time as someone who God cannot use? Were you born a second time that God, someone that God needs to kill again? God doesn't need to kill the new self. God doesn't need to break the new self. God doesn't need to do anything destructive to the new self. God is rooting us and grounding us in Jesus Christ, and he is building you up in him. And yes, that means the idea of some sort of sufficiency in other things. That stuff comes crumbling down. We get weaned off of it, right? Gavin has a hamster. You know the stories about Gavin's hamster. I've told a, one or two. But there's a new one. This hamster has basically hated the food that we've been giving him for like three months. And he's been picking through it meticulously. And he has piles. Piles of the stuff he doesn't like and piles of the stuff he does like. Well, yesterday we got wise. We got on the internet. We did a little research on exotic hamster food. You know what I'm talking about? Like the good stuff. <laughs> like the steak, you know. Like Kegel's hamster food. You know what I'm saying? If you haven't been to Kegel's, you need to try it out. But we got this food, and yesterday was a glorious, glorious resurrection day for this hamster. <laughs> I mean, he was eating foods and snacks like never before, and he loved it. So the idea that we get weaned off of some stuff, and we start tasting the better stuff, yeah, maybe there's some pain to it because some people have owned the old stuff and some people have pushed us toward the old stuff and some people have told us the old stuff is the best thing going. And yeah, we might lose out on some friends or some relationships might be damaged, but we start getting a taste of the new, newness. We start getting a taste of the really good food. We even start snacking between meals. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, there's a pain of divorcing ourselves from this stuff and weaning off of it. But we're meant for the new. We're meant for the very best. We're meant to eat steak. And so this process, although it could be painful to say no to sin sometimes and say yes to God, it is not God breaking you. It is actually God building you up in him. The old way is broken we are breaking away from it. It never paid off, 
But the new way is our destiny and we're being built up in it. The new man does not need to be killed. The new man does not need to be broken. The new man does not need to be shoved in a corner. And you are a new creation. I really don't understand how our future sins can be forgiven if they haven't been committed yet. Great question. Our future sins, I mean, I don't even know what those are for you, although I've got some guesses. (laughs) But I don't even know what those are yet. And yeah, we're teaching that you're already forgiven for your future sins. Now, is that crazy talk or what? You're already forgiven for your future sins. How could that be? Well, let me ask you this. If you're not forgiven for your future sins, how are you going to get forgiven? I thought it was blood that made you a forgiven person. Forgive me, but I thought Jesus died only once and shed his blood. I don't think he'll be shedding his blood anytime soon. Apparently, it worked the first time. And from the cross, he said, it's finished. So if it's about blood and it's not about your apologies then I'd say you're a forgiven person, past, present, and future. So we read about this. I mean, um, you know, Hebrews 9, 22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Um, Hebrews goes on to say that Jesus is not dying daily. He's not hanging on a cross up in heaven. You know, heaven doesn't have a cross in it. There was one cross 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ hung on, no repeat needed. So Hebrews 7.27, it says, not day after day, but once for all. You know what that means? Not today, and then tomorrow, and then tomorrow, and then tomorrow again, and then the next day, and the next day. Not day after day after day, but once for all. So if you haven't wrapped your mind around that, we really, our heart is that you see how forgiven you are. That tomorrow is already taken care of. Now again, man, I hope that brings a sense of excitement, a sense of peace, but in some of you, a sense of questioning, wondering, maybe even there's a sense of danger to that. You know, if the gospel doesn't sound dangerous, then it's probably not the grace of God. The grace of God is dangerous because he trusts us. He gives you a new heart. He he lets you off the hook. And he says, I'm going to trust you as my kid. I'm not going to control everything you do. I'm going to let you choose, but I've rigged it. I've given you a new heart, a new spirit, and my spirit to be your counselor. So I hope this sounds dangerous to you, because it is. We're experiencing a dangerous gospel, and there's a flip side to that danger. What if... What if it's not about rules and laws? What if it's not about conditional love and conditional forgiveness? What if this whole thing about God being this great, what if it really is true? Wow. Is God hijacking your future forgiveness, dangling it from a string to somehow get you to sin less? Makes no sense, because all you'd have to do is fire up an apology. Lord, please forgive me for the 17,000 sins I just did. Thank you. You can make it about your apologies if you want. Some people do. Oh, if you apologize, God promises to forgive you. All right, God, forgive me for everything I've ever done. Thank you. All right, now it's once for all. Wait a minute. Forgive me for the next one. Forgive me for the next one. All right, thank you. See, it's just absurd, Because we're either going to say God promises to respond to our apology or God promises to honor the blood of Jesus once for all. But either way, we get there. So which is the truth? Is it about you or is it about Jesus? All right, we're running out of time. Um, What about... It says, the idea of hyper-grace is getting popular. Do you teach hyper-grace? If not, what about confession and repentance? Yeah, um, we, we, we are definitely interested in admitting our wrongdoing. We are pro-confession. We want to int- in- introduce 
ourselves to people in our lives that we can begin to trust and dialogue with, but that has nothing to do with your forgiveness. We want to turn from sin every time, but that has nothing to do with your forgiveness. They're separate. I was doing a radio interview uh, recently, and I was talking about this forgiveness thing and how big it was and how awesome it was. And then the, the host wanted to say, well, but we need to be obedient. And I said, yes. And then I continued to talk about the forgiveness and the grace of God. And he said, but we need to be obedient. And I said, yes. And then I began to talk once again about how the Christian is totally forgiven. Because the, que the question was about, is the Christian a totally forgiven person? It's almost like we can't even touch this animal. We can't even talk about how great this forgiveness is without hedging it. We've got to come over here to topic two and say, but can we not devote some time to understand the meaning of the cross in full? Can we not devote some time to understand the value of the blood of Jesus and then move on in light of that full understanding to the idea that, you know what, if I'm clean and I'm close, I might actually start to think and act like a clean, close person. But if we get our foundation wrong and we keep saying, but, 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 then we'll never understand the product of that foundation. If our premise is wrong, the conclusions will be wrong. If you're tiling a floor and you get the first tile off base, guess what happens to the rest of the floor? What we're saying is, let's make sure we get that first tile, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Let's make sure we get that part right. All right, we'll finish with this. This one's funny. How do you even make your church budget if you don't teach about regular tithing? Well, today, in today's world, we have uh, the ability to go on Google and search for stuff. And you can go on Google and you can search for the three-month tithing challenge and this is the most popular way to teach giving today in fact I think it's up to about 400 churches now that have copy pasted three paragraphs word for word not different at the different churches all different denominations all different types of Christianity um, they've copy pasted these paragraphs about the three month tithing challenge and they have put it all over these websites and the reason they're doing that, you could say mindlessly, just imitating one another, is because apparently it's working. I mean, the idea is that if God doesn't pay you back for your tithe within three months, then you can come to the leadership and get your money back. Okay? Now, I don't know where we, we get the 90-day the deal with God from Scripture, I don't really see where we're told in Scripture we give to God, but there's a plan B. There's a back door where we can kind of exit and get our, get our refund outside. Um, and so it's a bit of a, it's more than a bit. It's a, it's a bunch of error. It really is. Because, uh, first of all, we don't buy God's blessings. God is not a slot machine where we put in enough tithe and pull down the handle of faith and out come the money, money uh, quantities of money back to us. We got to watch what we're saying and why we're saying it. The grace living is the same as the grace giving. Corinthians teaches us, hey, my friends, don't sit on your wallets. This is not the grace message right here. You sitting on your wallet, sitting on your hands, doing nothing. That's not grace. Corinthians says, don't give reluctantly. But you know what it also says? Don't give under pressure. Don't give under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. So how do we make budget? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it has, to do with some, has something to do with the people in the room and the God of the universe. But we decide to trust people. It doesn't mean we just clam up and don't make our needs known. We could do better at that. But we make our needs known, and we trust that God will work in people's hearts. And for 10 years, the 10 years I've been here, 
and going back before me, they made budget every single time. It's not been a time that we don't make budget. If, if we didn't make budget, it would be okay. Like God never says, I promise you will make budget. But the point is, grace works. We can trust people who are in Christ to be motivated by Christ. Matthew 23, 23 says, tithing is a matter of the law. There's not a single epistle that tells you to give 10% as a required amount. 2 Corinthians 8 would be the best place to visit. Give cheerfully from the heart. People are quoting Malachi 3 about blessings and curses. Malachi is all about the Jews and the law and the priests and the storehouse and the grain. It would be me asking you to bring in your Farley Barley, right? <laughs> it would be absurd and it would be wrong. So we teach it the way it is. We let God work in people's hearts and we trust that the gospel is awesome and that it works. Let's pray together. Father, we are uh, grateful for truth that sets us free. The truth about giving and the truth about living and the truth about speaking to one another in profitable language, the truth about praying, the truth about singing, the truth about living under grace and not under law, the truth about not having to die over and over again or kill ourselves spiritually or get rid of ourselves or exit stage left. We thank you Father, that you include us. You include us in the play, the production. You're the director, but you let, us, you let us act, and you let us play a role, and you let us be your children. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and celebrate God's grace as we dismiss this morning. trying to be controversial. We're not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. We're not trying to point out the every error that's out there. But man, you visit these letters, these New Testament letters where God has unfolded his heart to us. And, and Paul and Peter and James and John, they're working overtime to clarify. They want us to get it. They really want us to get it. And the reason they want us to get it is they know that there's going to be some unlearning and then some learning. There's going to be some detoxing. There's going to be some reprogramming. There's going to be some unloading of the old way and hanging on tightly to the new. And when we get hold of the new in all of its clarity, in all of its beauty, it begins to really set us free forever. Have a great day. Amen.